Duke Edwin the Bold of Mercia was England's most famous military commander, and its most powerful duke. He would have been king if not for the meddling army of France supporting the failed innkeep Robert. Now in 1112, he found himself leading that very same French army, bolstered with the bravest of the English fiefs, to fight the mighty host of the Holy Roman Empire. It was one of the largest and most brutal battles of the medieval period, seeing nearly 10,000 of the 30,000 combatants killed or wounded, among them Norman Count Robert of O. Thanks to Edwin's masterful strategy, the German army had been split down the centre, and thus saw the better part of those casualties. As fate would have it, it was in this way that French King Philip was repaid for his work trying to kill this same Edwin in the years prior. The victory was widely celebrated, but alas, it would later become known only as a good start to a great ordeal. In Rouen, the man who had been forced to force someone else to save France, King Robert of England, stood before some poor Breton who had been previously caught funding Welsh troops. On the King's grinning command, a mailed assistant turned the handle on the brand new dungeon rack. Were a philosopher of the Far East to visit the court in Rouen, he would have predicted that such things were happening in the Night Veiled Prison Tower for in life all things must be in balance. For Robert to have been acting so calmly and rationally around his court and family as he had been recently, he must have been relaxing in an equally remarkable fashion. Indeed, the more stretched his prisoner became, the more relaxed he felt, and soon Robert felt so relaxed he could just die. For Edwin of Mercia the situation was quite the opposite. Just before his 70th birthday, he fell fatally ill somewhere in the Low Countries, passing away within days. He died a hero to his men, and the peoples of England, Normandy and France, who had all feared him as an opponent and found their salvation with him as an ally and a leader. Tears enough were shed for him to drown a king, even one as buoyant as Robert. Without him, the English army began to falter, and the French army it had marched with went its own way, eventually to be cornered and defeated by the Germans. The English would meet the same end if they stayed on the continent, and luckily enough Robert ordered them to sail for England all of a sudden. Their king was going to offer them the luxury of fighting on their own soil, but we are getting ahead of the story. Matters began when Robert's daughter Matilda came to the king with a tale of bad behaviour. She claimed that a servant in Rouen had been talking to a strange man who kept coming to the castle, talking in English. The child was among the few in Normandy versed enough in the language to know what they were talking about. The servant was selling military information to an agent of King Merlis Wegen. Robert had laughed the tall tale away. The lies she would come up with to pretend she had a good reason to stay up past her bedtime. Incredible, the imagination of a child. He could respect her dedication to the lie though. The more he questioned it, the more she insisted it was true, providing quickly invented details that gave off not a whiff of falsehood. But of course, it all must have been a lie in the end, for all knew that old King Merlis Wagon was safely stowed in a hole in the ground somewhere in the southern reaches of the Cotswold Hills. However, many moons later, information to the contrary arose. If you recall, King Robert had once employed an officer named Robert de Conteville, known these days as Robert de Conversano. King Robert had helped to organise the lesser Robert's death in order to please his sister Agatha and one Avis de Clare from his old court in Maine. This death had never come to pass, and the King and Agatha both had switched their murderous focus onto others over time. Madame de Clare, however, had lived a life of vendetta, and was now said to be camped outside a church in Westminster in which Robert de Conversano was chaplain. In fact, he was the highest chaplain in England at the time, having proved to be an extremely dedicated man of God, ensuring he always kept himself to monasteries where women, especially murderous ones, were forbidden to tread. 
King Robert, not recognizing the man as the same servant he had prepared a poisoned wine for and subsequently spilled decades earlier, he had told de Conversano to go to Rome and secure the legitimacy of House Normandy's claim to England with the new Pope, before promptly forgetting England ever had a high chaplain. De Clare had thus been camping on those holy steps in vain, but she would not walk away empty-handed. A haggard man with a striking resemblance to the old King of England had come to those same steps seeking the same chaplain, and the chance to overturn the papacy's opinion of the new king. It was love at first sight. Their wild nights were soon famous in Westminster, with all the inns knowing of the rich, slurring lovers swaying down the streets in linen jesters' crowns, shouting of how they were to kill many a Robert and be king and queen of all England. Their loud romance thus revealed to all parties concerned that Merla's wagon was out and about with legitimate claim to the throne. Many English lords were interested, not just when it came to electing a successor to King Robert, but perhaps for something a little more violent and immediate. And so at last we reached the point alluded to previously. Robert, knowing what must be done, returned his men to England and arranged an audience with Duke Merlis Wagon. He accused the Duke of being publicly drunk and plotting to murder a man of God, two crimes to which there were witnesses aplenty. No duke and wannabe king could ever admit to such bawdy acts, so he was forced to deny the claims through war. Since the war was specifically about Merlis Wagon's right to shout drunken threats on a warm summer's night, his allies in the bid for the throne, the Dukes of York and Essex, could not be seen supporting him. Thus, Robert's force was guaranteed to win out over Merlis Wagon's levy, and give the king another notch on his bedpost which he was of course using to count the number of civil wars he had won, like any true man of ambition. Ultimately then, young Matilda's sleuthing had been justified all along. The thing was, Robert had not only laughed at her at the time, but had never returned to the matter and overturned his previous judgement. The girl's ambitions had been squashed by this stonewalling from her father. Her tutors reported to Robert that she suddenly seemed uninterested in anything they had to say. Robert put a word in with God to maybe sort her out, but one could suppose God didn't consider that to be his responsibility, and even resented the request. Perhaps he was bored, for instead he bent the rivers of fate in a frustrating fashion. Another young Matilda was inspired to serve her noble father Robert. I speak now of Matilda, Countess of O, the eight-year-old inheritor to fallen Robert of O, and would-be avenger of her father's death through a declaration of war on King Philip of France, the man who had refused command of the right flank in that great battle, and hence had seen her father killed. King Robert turned a blind, bloodshot eye to that whole affair. Not long after that, Merlis Wagon was finally moved into his new home in Rouen Dungeon, where he would pass away within a year. Another claimant to the throne was gone, but there were plenty more for the English electors to choose from. Around that time, the current favourite was Sinhelm of Mercia, son of the late Edwin the Bold. He had no claim to the throne at all, really, yet he might get it if the petty dukes were allowed to exercise that strange voting right they all claimed to have. Robert would never convince them of how stupid they were all being when all were talking of military matters at every court session, so he had to pray the French got on and surrendered to the Germans without too much delay. One wonders if God reinterpreted his request into another context there as well. In 1116 at least, the matter would drag on for many years yet. That meant Robert had to play the English game. He had to 1. convince English lords to support his dynasty, such as with the latest war against Scotland to expand the Duchy of Northumberland, and 2. kill or imprison his most popular rivals, such as with his attempt to arrest Sinhelm for plotting usurpation, sparking another civil war. Just as with the last one, Robert's men were ready at the starting blocks for the next inevitable breakdown of the realm, and jumped into action before the Mercians even found out why they were at war with the rest of England again. 
In both of those wars, things had gone suspiciously smoothly, and Robert was soon to find out why. The Scottish and Mercian armies had decided to smuggle themselves onto the mainland and join forces to attack Rouen. Together, they could almost match Robert's army. Yet, to defeat both of these foes at once would only prove to the electors that God was on Robert's side, so he happily ordered that battle be joined. But he didn't have Edwin the Bold fighting for him this time. He didn't have King Philip of France fighting for him this time. It was just his own men, with his own household commanders, who he had never taken any interest in training or selecting for any special talent. Thus, the battle was fought without much consideration. The English plied their trade with their longbows for a while, then charged into the Allied lines, saw that said lines looked much more heavily armoured and serious up close, and immediately retreated. The Allies pursued and turned the day into a rout, leaving the English without the strength to attack again, and the Allies with all the time they needed to breach and occupy Rouen. Robert was now a prisoner in his own castle. His lines of communication with the outside world were severely limited, leaving him in a most dire situation. He was forced to spend time with his wife. Outside their chamber, the guards chatted in a tongue-twisting Highland fashion. The couple listened to it carefully, anything to hear not the continuing silence between them. Their children and assistant mothers were confined to their own rooms until Robert formally ended the war, so all the eyes of House Normandy were on him, none more piercingly so than Mare's. Robert stood at his window for most of the passing days, muttering of victory, chewing on chicken legs and sucking on bones maddeningly loudly. Mare refused to let the oaf keep her from her children, her real children that is, any longer. One night, a raven landed at the window, carrying on its talons a vial of black liquid and a note from Richard, brother of the king. It simply read, Save us all, for God's sake. The next morning came, along with the next serving of chicken legs. Mare carefully laced the greasy treat with the black poison, which diluted into the fats and became quite unnoticeable. Then all she needed to do was sit back in bed and watch Robert emerge from the privy, march to the table to collect his first breakfast, then turn to take his last look out at the kingdom he had won. Yes, come to think of it, Robert had done rather a lot with his life, hadn't he? Never had he faltered before, and nor did he now. Such courage and confidence, such nobility. Ah, but he thinks nothing of his own family, Mare assured herself. Let him bite down on his fate, his just dessert. Robert raised a piece of the chicken to his mouth, but halted. Mare could not dare breathe. Then it was lowered again, before Robert turned and admitted that he could not eat any more when he did not even know if poor Matilda was being fed properly, and even less of Selene at the mercy of the Germans in Paris. Mare emitted a strange gasp, scrambled forward to take the plate from her husband, and then without hesitation cast the food from the window, her tears washing the plate clean. There would be times all too soon when she would regret not going through with her scheme, but perhaps had she actually done so, there would be far more she would regret. As for the Siege of Rouen, that situation would funnily enough be resolved by a very similar drama far to the north, where English troops had Scottish King Ronald also cooped up with his family. Ronald had not the will to stand it any longer, and surrendered to the English, with news of this arriving just as the English were in full retreat from a failed attempt to take the city. 1200 Scots marched off to return home then, allowing the surviving English to eventually regroup and overwhelm the Mercians. Robert's fortunes had bounced back from the brink once again. Matilda turned 16 just as the countryside in Rouen was cleansed of rebels, and off she went to Navarra to sit as queen. Just to the south, the French were prying the Germans out of their own capital and as it happened, the Emperor soon decided to cancel his invasion, even though it was progressing quite well. Perhaps he feared the spectre of a newly reunified England rejoining the fray. 
reasonable perhaps, but we know today that England was still a long way from unification. Putting the schism of Mercia and Greater England aside, a great shattering of the Normandy family was about to take place. Robert had spent many months living in the near-exclusive company of his wife, speaking of their children, their kingdom, and the dynasty. It seemed that over the years, they really had shared quite the adventure together, even if they had not always rode side by side. After such times and inviting sentiments, when court resumed and Adelin and Bava flanked his throne, he could hardly bear to speak with them. Suddenly he saw the matriarchal triumvirate of House Normandy as the badge of betrayal and selfishness that others complained of. It was time, at last, for the madness to end. He dismissed both mistresses from his court, and later informed them that it would be better if they no longer came to visit him in Rouen Castle. There was nothing the two women could do to hang on to their lives as de facto royalty. Even the fact that their children were the princes and princesses of the realm was useless, for Robert had legitimized them. So while all knew the open truth of the matter, when it came to legal formalities, Mare was mother of them all. Regent Adeline and Royal Consort Bava were thus struck from the rolls and sent to live out their days in a strange-smelling inn just outside of the city. Robert did the courtesy of paying, but then again, it was the cheapest inn for quite some distance. Now the English army just needed to boot the Mercians off the continent, then return to the continent themselves to finish the job, restoring power to the emptying nest in Rouen. Yet nothing is so simple in a Frenchman's England. Now the Duke of Essex, the one who Princess Matilda should at that very moment be marrying, according to Robert's long-forgotten promise, declared himself King of England, and the Duke of York pledged his support. Civil war with a side of civil war. That bedpost was going to be less notched and more splintered before long. Robert was rather at a loss. He was 65 years old, which was quite the burden for a man who had lived through a lifetime of constant peril and betrayal, war and wine. He could only remain in Rouen, now willingly cohabiting with Mare and his youngest offspring. Throughout his life, he had asked God what must be done to finally allow him to be happy. Now, he discussed with his family a slightly reworded query. What should he do to make them all happy? The answer was ultimately that he had already done everything he needed to do. The peril of the time was only superficial. Three kings of England there might be, but the Mercian was many times defeated now, and the Essexer would soon have to face the newly available armies of France. The Normandy dynasty had been risen from a sneered-at dukedom living on borrowed land to the overlords of a rich and expanding kingdom that now rivaled the one wreathed in the laurels of their old Frankish overlords, all on the watch of King Robert. There was just one thing left to perfect his legacy, to have his heir, Robert of Maine the Younger, start where the Elder had finished, as king. Winning the dual civil wars of the age would give him more than enough momentum to override his vassals and declare a traditional monarchy. And as said, victory was inevitable in both cases. In fact, the Mercians were effectively beaten already. But there was a catch. Sinhelm knew that his king would surely look to crush the electors in the aftermath of the war. Hence, he had to arrange for the war to be impossible to conclude formally. To that end, he declared war on the petty kings of Ireland and Wales, and invited them to invade Mercian territory. All he had to do was get himself captured, and now Robert's messengers carrying the terms to end the rebellion would never be able to find him. It worked perfectly. Robert was told by some Irish lord that the English would have to take that Mercian coward back from their cold, dead hands, and no messengers were allowed anywhere near him. So then, while not much fighting took place, Mercia remained apart from England, and the administration of the region remained in chaos. 
The Duke of Essex had his dreams of royalty crushed in short order, and the Duke of York slunk back to his seat on the King's Council without anyone paying him too much attention. That left only the wars with the Lords of Britannia from outside England's borders, one of whom was rumoured to be keeping the Duke of Mercia as a jester. Very few English troops remained able to fight after a decade of constant war, so getting Sinhelm back was not a guarantee. Let also be taken into consideration that Rouen was once again set to siege by a Mercian warband, and overall it will be no surprise that Robert was at his wit's end. He was on the verge of securing the complete and incontestable usurpation of the English throne, after countless battles, countless rebellions, and countless proofs of his destiny. But the final piece of the puzzle was hidden in darkness, in reach, but too small and soft to the touch to be found with his failing strength. As the year 1120 progressed, he was increasingly confined to his bed. His desperation to hang on and see his dreams fulfilled, only pushing his overloaded body closer to the edge. In March, he commissioned a great memorial painting of his father William to be placed in Rouen's Grand Hall. The final image portrayed William standing beneath a tree, reaching up at a golden crown hanging from the branches. It was beyond his reach, yet at his side was a young boy looking out at the viewer with a grin. In the boy's hands was a golden saw. The sight of this work produced from Robert the last of his overly long bouts of laughter, interrupted as it was with splurting, coughing and clawing gestures towards the empty wine jug on the table. In July, as men searched for Sinhelm in war-torn Wales, news arrived that Adeline had passed away of old age over at the King's Bounty, aka the Salted Turnip. It was hard for Mare to find the energy to comfort poor bedridden Robert on this matter, but even she could see the romance in it. Those two had been together for pretty much their whole lives, from the drafty halls of Le Mans in those first winters, to the warm waters of Bath for Robert's coronation, from the messy battlefields across the realm to the orderly quiet of Rouen Castle. Adeline had ever been Robert's companion, and by the shared experience of motherhood, she hadn't quite ever been Mayer's enemy. She was given a formal funeral befitting a woman of nobility, which was to be the last public event that tired old Robert would attend. Not helped by the sadness of the affair, his health worsened, and it became clear that the minds of the English electors would soon have to be made up. The way the dice had fallen may have frustrated Robert's final ambition, but there was a rather remarkable silver lining to it all. The most popular candidate for the throne was Sinhelm, but he was not only missing, but was a wanted man, legally speaking, so his supporters would have to either take up arms and join the war, or find someone else to vote for. No one took the former path. Additionally, there was the realm of Northumbria, which had grown greatly with House Normandy's support. On the south coast, where Normans did not seem so foreign, there was support for a continued union across the Channel also. That December, all of these factors combined turned one Robert of Maine the Younger into Robert II of England. His father had passed of illnesses unknown, thought to be brought on by his constant worry for his legacy. He was right to be worried, for his personal reputation left much to be desired. Many across Britannia and France nodded in satisfaction to the refrain that the cruel king would be punished for his sins in the afterlife. Yet none could deny that as the head of House Normandy, there had been none better. Not yet, anyway, for King Robert II was not at all like his father. He was adored in his counties of Maine and Rennes, known for an astonishing lack of greed, malice or foul humour, given the beast that spawned him. Soon the English would come to adore him too, as he not only outshone their own nobility by his charm and composure, but eagerly took to the task of pursuing English interests at war. Over the next few years, the Welsh and Irish incursions were halted, Sinhelm was recovered and transferred to Rouen to serve his rightful punishment, and England was at last able to enjoy unity and peace. 
and if they ever got tired of that, the king could press further claims on England's borders to continue the English rise to dominance, and perhaps become the new Alfred the Great. The dream of a united England would stand aside for the dream of a united Britannia. So then, it seemed that England truly was going to be left in good hands, rather cleaner than the last pair. Now the prospect of removing the English electors was only a matter of time. House Normandy's destiny seemed yet more grand, and promised much more than a crown before the end. That is not to say that all was suddenly perfect. For example, the king's mother, Mare, was well aware that her luxurious life in Rouen could easily be overturned if someone pointed out the commonly known fact that the consort, Bava, was Robert's real mother. So it was that Bava was eventually found dead in a pile of turnips. While Mare must have been the prime suspect, the news was drowned out by the talk from Paris. Prince Philip had suddenly died of illness, leaving Princess Solène widowed at 25 and no longer married to a royal heir. After hearing this whole tale, you can probably imagine how she felt. She grew up being told again and again that she would be queen. She had been told that it was her destiny, her right, and that nothing was to stand in her way. She had been promised a crown, but suddenly it had been snatched away without warning. A lesser woman may have accepted her fate. A lesser woman may have allowed God to play his little jokes on House Normandy unopposed. But Princess Solène had learned from the best. With chicken in one hand and a forged document in the other, she set out to follow her father into the history books, one way or another. Did she make it? Well, I'm afraid that's another story entirely. Thank you very much for watching slash listening to The Promised Crown. A very special thanks goes out to all of the officially Devon patrons who fund the channel and make projects like this possible. If you're feeling particularly rich, you can check the links in the description to contribute yourself. The next series I'll be making will be a Mount and Blade narrative let's play, probably starting within the next two weeks. Shouldn't be too long. I expect I'll return to this style to make another game campaign themed novella thing at some point, because it's quite fun to write things like this. So do let me know if you enjoy this style and what other games or campaigns you think it would be suitable for. So I guess that's it. I've been Offie D, and thanks again for joining me for this series.